Uh, Mark G was born in London in 1951. After finishing his schooling, he came to India in 1969, where he began his sadhana and study of Sanskrit and sitar. In 1975, he returned to England and studied for a doctorate at the University of Oxford. He completed it in 1979, and his thesis was published as The Doctrine of Vibration. In 1976, he went to Kashmir and received initiation from Sir Amir Lakshmanju. He's also the disciple of Oxford Professor Sanderson, Pandit Chakravarti, and Rajwalla Vediji former head of yoga tantra department in Sampurnanand Sanskrit University. He worked on a project for the IGNCA for 20 years up to 2007 to make an addition and extensively amputated translation in 14 volumes of a section of the Manthana Bhairava Tantra. He's the author of several other books and numerous articles. His latest publication is an extensively annotated translation of Abhinav Gupta's Tantra Loka along with Jay Ratha's commentary. It's in 13 volumes. Between 2007 and 18, he planned and supervised the production of over 350 texts of tantric books and manuscripts of primary importance of Mukta Bodha's online digital library. He's taught the world giving lectures at numerous universities, guiding practice and playing sitar for decades. Mark Chi will be speaking on Abhinav Gupta's revival and profound exegesis of Trika Shaivism. Mark Chi, the stage is Thank all you. yours. Thank you. I'm very sorry. I, uh, I fell asleep. I'm not so well. Uh, I feel very fortunate uh, to have been able to join you all. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'll try and be brief. Um, see, I, I hope that what I'm going to say now, you don't find too outrageous. Um, because what I'm going to attempt to do um, is to outline uh, the development uh, and interaction between different schools that together we call Shaivagama and that emerged in one part of them um, in Kashmir around the ninth century into different schools. Um, I'd like to do it in such a way as to put a little order into this chaos. Um, you know, if you get a salad and you mix everything up and you put everything together, then it has a very interesting flavor and there are many things there. Um, I, I've worked on Tantra Loka since 1975. Um, the translation of the text, um, I finished many, many years ago. Why I did not have taken so long to publish is because, well, I don't want to die without finishing it. But the main reason, uh, uh, the reason is, is that I've been searching for the sources of Tantra Loka. And uh, that was a long process because some of the sources are published and some of the sources are not published. So I had to find the manuscripts, all that were available. I had to get them transcribed. I had to uh, um, uh, make editions as far as I could of the texts. Uh, and I had to, first of all, try and make sense of what's going on with Abhinav Gupta. What is his method? See, Abhinav Gupta, he quotes from Kamikagama, from the Nishi Sanchara, and from the Kiranagama. He quotes something he says is practically the same thing, and he repeats it two or three times in the course of Tantra Loka. So we hear this line or something similar to it at least five or six times. It's the one most quoted single thing. Tripratyaya midam gyanam guruta shastrata swataha. Now, idam gyanam means the gyanam that he is presenting in Tantra Loka, and which is Trika. For him, presentation, of course, is uh, the teachings of Trika. And it has three pratyayas. Pratyaya can mean two things, source and also validation. Two things it means. So one is a teacher, the other is scripture, and the third is one's own self. Now, as I went on reading and studying Tantra Loka, uh, I wanted to know where Abhinav Gupta was getting what he's saying from. So I found that um, collecting, he tells us, he's quite uh, honest in this way, 
Um, he doesn't cheat. And he tells us, I get this from my teacher, Shambhunata, or some other guru. I get this from this particular Shastra, of course. The most one he draws from the most is the Malivide Uttara, which he considers to be the highest uh, scripture, thicker scripture, and hence the highest scripture in the whole of the Shaivagama. Um, and he tells us also, sometimes he, he never really tells us that he has thought of this himself. This is one thing that he fails to do. Yeah. And um, Shem and Jarata is always very keen to minimize the amount of what is being presented as being his own. He doesn't he doesn't want to be his swa upagya, simply his own idea. Because of the Indian tradition, as we all know very well, simply saying something from your own head that this is what I think or I believe. Uh, maybe as Abhin Gupta, you could do that, but certainly not as Mark Dichkovsky or most of any of us. Um, so, uh, but nonetheless, uh, if you look at what he got from his teacher, which he tells us, um, and you look at what he got from the scriptures, which he tells us, and then you subtract that from what he says, what is left, you have an idea, a good idea, of what he has added. Ah. Now, in the course of doing all this, it was first of all necessary, before even beginning, to understand what he's doing, why he's doing it. Now, for that, we have to deal for a few minutes, and I'm trying to be very brief here, um, in the history of the Shaivaga. In the history of the Shaivaga. Now, in the past 50 years, uh, a tremendous amount of work has been done uh, by Sanderson and his students. And um, for better or worse, whether people like it or not, I'm his first student, his oldest student. I'm also Swamiji's disciple. I, there's no contradiction there. And like all his other students and good old Somadeva um, and uh, others in KISS now from Russia, uh, from Hungary, the younger people, I was engaged in searching for sources. Um, because this is what Sanderson had put us all to work. He'd written, a, a, a worked out a map of the Shaivagama, how it had developed. And the next thing to do was to find the text, to edit them, to work out the details, what he would call plotter's work. Now, in the course of doing that in the past 50 years, uh, my humble self, and the others, all greater than me, I'm the smallest of them, um, a great number of discoveries have been made, which have given us a fairly reliable chronology of the uh, uh, Siddhanta of the Shaivagamas, uh, and has taught us a great deal about uh, uh, what the different traditions um, that developed along the history of this, uh, this multi-current, this river with many streams, um, as it's flowed along um, through the centuries, um, how they have flown and what they've contained. Now, first thing is, um, the oldest tantra that we found is the Nishwasa Tantra Samhita, which is 5th or 6th century AD. It is the oldest. That's 5th, 6th century AD. Now, you tell me, oh, Shaiva Agama, goes back to Anadi Kal and so on. Well, in a certain sense, of course, it does. I don't, I believe Lord Shiva exists. And I do believe that he speaks and that it is his, his, his virtue. Okay. But at the same time, um, uh, uh, his virtue emerges within history. Certain times within history. Now, I'd like to say just two words as a prelude to what allowed for Siddhanta Agama to emerge in the 5th, 6th century. And one of the major factors was the development of the concept of Shakti. You may not have noticed, but if you do, it's very mind-blowing, that in the Durga Saptashati, Durga Ji is never called Shakti. Although she is every day nowadays, you know, 
See, what happens is what we learn, what develops in the future, the subsequent time is projected into the past. So whether you're a foreigner or an Indian in this way, you're a thousand years or two thousand years away equally, whether you were born in England or you were born in India. And we're both peering into the past. And through that, we're seeing into that many, many layers of events, ideas, um, et cetera, that have um, intervened between us and the past as we look back into it. So it's very, it's, uh, we should try and pull that all away and try and see what was there a thousand years ago, 1500 years ago. Huh? Nowhere in the Devi Sapta Shakti is the goddess called Shakti. She's called Prakriti in many places. She's called Prakriti. She is made from the Tejas of the gods. There's a, a demon, they can't be defeated by one of deity alone. So they all pull their Tejas. And uh, the goddess appears as a composite of all their Tejas, not Shakti. The word Shakti not used. The Tejas is completely co concretely expressed by the weapons that they have. And she goes on and kills the demon and everything, the stories that we all know. Nowhere is she called Shakti. Okay? Second, look at the Bhagavad Gita. Nowhere in the Bhagavad Gita do we have the word Shakti. I challenge you, I'll give you a lakh, I'll give you ten lakhs if you find the word anywhere in the Bhagavad Gita. Okay? Now that means that I have to say, uh, third, fourth, fifth century AD, the, the term Shakti, with all its multivalence, and it has a huge number of meanings, it doesn't just mean energy or goddess. Yeah. It means, you know, functional efficacy. It means an amazing number of things. Now, nothing, okay, the first time that we come across it being used in the, in the very way that we see nowadays, with the full richness of its possibility, is in Bhartrihari. Anadi Nidanam Brahma, the Brahman of Shabda Brahman, the word speech, every word, everything, every sentence that is uttered or ever will be, huh, is coming from, is all the Shabda Brahman. And the Shabda, why is, how is that possible? Well, because the Shabda Brahman has Ananta Shaktis. He has an infinite number of energies, right? So one of the many features of Shakti is that though she's one Shakti, she has many energies, all right? So by the 5th, 6th century AD, which is the, the agreed time of Bharti Hari, yeah, this concept of Shakti had developed within the milieu of speech, which is very appropriate. Now, when that concept had developed, it was possible to have tantras. You won't be able to find go more than one shloka in any tantra, if it's a siddhanta, or if it's a bite of a tantra, it's a trika tantra, it's a krama, or whatever, to perform rituals, to utter mantras, to understand the nature of deity. And the concept of Shakti is pervasive and fundamental. Without that, you could not have any tantric tradition at all. Okay? So very soon, within the time of Bhartrihari, very soon, uh, as soon as it was possible, the tantras began to develop with their distinctive paradigms. That is to say, particular ways of doing puja um, that um, uh, would make up what you might call the tantric paradigm. Right? Now, those traditions, they developed with this Rasa Tattva Samhita, which was rather close to Purana. In the Mula, Nishwasa Tattva Samhita was rather closer to Puranas. Uh, and you could see a kind of transition from what was called Shiva Dharma or Shiva Dharmota, which is more Puranic than Tantric. You know, the, um, uh, the value of digging wells, the value of digging roads, doing good to others, the worship of Shiva Lingam very uh, basic ethics of being a good Shaivite, all the kind of things you get in the Shiva Purana or Linga Purana, okay? Uh, and then it moves on into the uh, Uttara Sutra, 
um, in which you get the uh, basic rituals. And of course, the main things like Nyasa. Nyasa. Yeah? And um, how the fourth forbidden of Nyasa, the invocation of deity, and all these things that constitute uh, the, uh, the, de the details of a, a tantric ritual. Right? Now, very soon, with, along the same time, uh, 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 that the Nishwasa Tattu Samhita is a kind of Siddhanta. Uh, Sada Shiva is the supreme deity. Uh, it's mostly male oriented. Um, supreme deity is actually Rudra. The supreme deity is actually Rudra. Rudra is a very good, ample, good, really excellent tantric deity because he has many, many, many forms. One Rudra becomes 10, 10 become 100, 100 become 10,000, and so on. And just the same way, Shakti proliferates. The one Shakti goes on developing into countless energies. Ah, Shakti Yastu Jagat Kitslam, Shakti Manstu Maheshwara, all the, en all the world of energies, the possessor of that energy is us, Shakti Man is uh, Maheshwara. Okay. So then, <clears throat> Um, then, <clears throat> but still, <clears throat> there in uh, Nishwasa Tattu Samhita, the dominant ethic is male. Deities are a male. There are female deities, embodiments of Shakti. One of the features of the concept of Shakti is that she's also a goddess, not just energy. Uh, in the Veda, Veda was full of Orjas and Uljas and Tejas. They're all kinds of words for energy, but uh, it was nowhere necessary that that energy should be a goddess. You think about it. I mean, what I'm telling you, I think you should think uh, is rather quite changes the history of uh, Hinduism. Ah. So please excuse me if you disagree and you're thinking I'm trying to corrupt our Hinduism. But uh, if you... Uh, it's just a matter of observation, you know, I'm not writing it. But now, within that, there were two main streams in which was developed into Shaiva Siddhanta, and another was to worship in a manner where the central deity is called Bhairava, although the dominant forms uh, in that, uh, in the Bhairava Tantras, our energies, our Shakti is called yoginis or devis. Okay? Now it is in that milieu that we begin to find tantras of different schools. And the one that concerns us is the Trika Tantra, the Siddha Yogeshwari Mata. Okay? And other... Um, so within these... Uh, it Within fairly early on, within the Brahma Yamala, you have a presentation um, of the uh, 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 Shaiva Agama as consisting of 64 Bhairava Tantras, uh, 10 Shiva Agamas, and 18 Rudra Agamas. Okay? Now that's in chapter 39, uh, the, the, the uh, Tantra Avatara, uh, chapter 39 of the Brahma Yamala Tantra. Unedited text is there. Okay? Now, in there you have the 28 names of 28 Siddhartha Agamas, of which we have no evidence at all for the existence of any but half a dozen of them. The ones that we know existed are the ones that Abhinava Gupta quotes, and manuscripts of those are found in Nepal. Okay? So, uh, anyway, the point is, is that um, from the 5th or 6th century AD, a tremendous number of such tantras are being written of different schools, different currents, okay? Uh, and they have a history of development. For example, a fellow called Matsyendra Nata begins to appear by about the 7th, 8th century AD. He doesn't exist any, in any earlier stratum of the Agama, um, and he becomes very important because He's supposed to be the founder figure of Kaulism that has different schools, one of which is the Krama system, in which Kali is the main goddess. Another one later on came to be, and, and another one is Trika system. Hmm. 
which came to be considered to be uh, a Kala tradition. And like all Kala traditions, um, they were ultimately uh, founded by a man called Matsendranata. I've written about all of this. It's very well documented and it's very well proved. Um, uh, okay. There are independent works attributed to him. They're non-sectarian and sectarian. Some of them are associated with, uh, for example, the Pashima Amnaya, some of them with Yutra Amnaya, the Kali Tantras, and some of them are not associated with any particular Amnaya, and they don't have a particular deity. They have a Bhairava and Bhairavi in a nondescript way, and Kula and Nakula. Texts like the Kaula Gyan and Nirnaya, which is published, and the Kula Panchashatika, which has not yet been published. Okay. Now, by the time we reach the ninth century, now one thing you may notice that until the ninth, middle of the ninth century, where Shiva Sutra appears, we have no commentary on any tantra except by a man called Sadio Jyotis, who maybe about a hundred years earlier um, had wrote commentaries on the Road of the Sutra Sangraha the Swayambhuva Sutra Sangraha, and an independent work called the Nadeshwara Pariksha. Ah, now, there were no commentaries on any tantras of any kind to call before the ninth, middle of the ninth century. The Buddhists had already begun to develop the commentatorial tradition. The earliest commentaries on the Gukhya Samaja and the Hevajra Tantra predate that. But this had not happened in the, in the Shaivala. Right. Now, in the middle of the ninth century, uh, momentous events took place on three or four different fronts simultaneously. Who knows? History is like that. You know, there are sort of moments as a big bang. You know, right? Now, three or four things happened. One is that the Shiva Sutras was revealed by Lord Shiva. Now, this is a scripture because it's Lord Shiva who is speaking. Okay. But it's a very different scripture from all the rest. It's not part of the Siddhant, of the Shaivagama in the strict sense, because the Shaivagama is uttered by the five faces of Sada Shiva. Ah, and it has Agamas and Upagamas and all of that had it been quite systematized, okay, by the middle of the ninth century. So it is it is Shaiva scripture and his revelation, but it's not Agama in the sense that all the others are. The 64 and 10 and 28 I mentioned. Okay. Next, what happens sim pretty well simultaneously is that Somananda, he wrote the Shiva Drishti. Now, the Shiva Drishti, Somananda tells us very clearly, uh, as the, is the, are the teachings that were revealed by Sri Kanta on Mount Kailash, first of all to the Rishis, meaning Vedikas. No? But these rishis were dying out or went away and so on. And so there was a fear of the loss. So he taught it to Durvasa, his mind-born son. Durvasa taught it to others. And in a series of 40 generations, it came down to Somananda, who set it down finally in writing. Okay. Now, what that means is that this teaching is coming from Lord Shiva in the form of Sri Kanta. But again, it's not Siddhanta, it's not Agama in the same way that the 64 Bhairava Tantras, etc. are, okay? But it is authoritative, as authoritative as scripture, because it's ultimately coming from Sri Kanta, okay? Then his disciple Utpaladeva, as you know, went on to write the, the Ishvara Pratibhigya and so on, okay? This is what is for the third big event happening simultaneously. Huh? And there's a fourth one, which is not so clear, which I'll mention after this. Shiva Ananda comes from Uddiyana Pita, from Uttara Pita, which is in Swat Valley. Uh, he makes the crossing, which is about 150 miles, in a lot of ups and downs, as, a, as the cold crows, probably at least two or three weeks of arduous journey. And he ends up in the Kashmir Valley, and he brings with him uh, the Kali Krama or the Kali Kula. Okay, this is according to the way of the tradition. I don't think that's the way it's quite happened, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Okay, he receives a revelation 
from the Kala Sankarshini, the goddess of the Krama system, uh, in the form of a goddess called Mangala. Well, there is a, 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 a the Tibetans, uh, they believe that Udhyana Pita was Shangri-La, kind of paradisical place. And there is a, a, a travel guide that was written by a Lama in the 13th century to Shangri-La. And you'll be happy to know that there in Uriana, there lived a lot of yoginis. And there was one who lived under a tree called Mangala, Mangala Devi. Okay? So we have confirmation that there is a goddess Mangala who is in Uriana Pita. Okay? And she's a bodyman of Kala Sankarshi. Okay? Now, this is the situation in the 9th century AD. Okay? It's a kind of, um, uh, uh, one other thing I should tell you, we know from Abhinavagupta <clears throat> that the Paratrinshika was known and studied and had an extensive commentary by several people prior to him. Um, that means, and when exactly how, and one of them was by a man called Saumananda. Now, I'm still not sure whether that's the same Sohmananda who wrote the Shiva Drishti, but uh, people do believe that, so it's easy. If it is, ah, it makes a lot of sense if it is. In which case, Sohmananda who wrote the Shiva Drishti was commenting on a, on a tantra uh, called a Trika Tantra, specifically known within the tradition as being a Trika Tantra. Okay? So this is a commentary. This is our first commentary on a tantra, and specifically on a trika tantra that we know that's not a sedanta. Okay, the Shiva, so Shiva Drishti is not a commentary. The Shiva Sutra is not a commentary, but the Spandakarika considers himself to be a commentary. So they're a commentary, not on Shaivagama in the ones of the currents of Ashana Shiva, uh, of uh, Sarashiva's faces, they're a commentary on an ulterior revelation. Okay? This man is very agitated. If he could just sit down, it would be good. Hello. I don't want to be telling you things, understand? Like I'm the guy who knows, and you don't know, I mean, that would be very wrong. Yeah. I, I should tell you that most of what I'm telling you um, Sanderson wrote about many years ago. Um, what I'm telling you um, has some of my own, but uh, Sanderson is the person who wants this out, okay? It's not this clever dick, Mark Dijkowski, like that, okay? Um, it all makes complete sense if you just look at what is there, okay? Now, I'm an Gupta, and I'm getting to the point now, and I don't want to be too long because... I've not looked at the time I've started. I'm allowed, I think, 45 minutes at the most. I'm rather talkative, so I'll take as many minutes as I'm allowed, uh, and you can bear to listen. Um, now, Abhinava Gupta, uh, we know very well that he was a disciple of the disciple of Utpaladeva, and Utpaladeva was the disciple of Sobananda. So we're four generations down from the revelation of the Shiva Sutra, from the coming of Shivananda into the valley, from the writing of the Shiva Drishti, which you, you might call non-dualist Shaivism, a tract on non-dualist Shaivism. You wouldn't call it Trika Tantra. You wouldn't call it Trika philosophy, right? He never did. The word Trika doesn't appear anywhere there, okay? He, he called it uh, Paradvaita, Paramadvaita, he gave it these kind of names, Shaiva Dvaita, okay? And then, okay? So Abhinav Gupta's four generations down. Now that means that in a hundred years, or four generations, a hundred, hundred and fifty years, we have had uh, maybe a commentaries, we've had a lot of little tracks being written. Small facts, some of which, for example, like the Spanda Pradipika, 
the commentary on the Panda Karika, uh, a good number of them elected in there. And within, amongst those small tracts, are passages from the Mani Vijay Uttara. That's so important. Well, it is, because I've been able to consider that to be Supreme Trika Tantra. Right? So we know, because of Shimaranda's commentary on the, on the Paratrishika, we know, because people are referring to the Mani Vijay Uttara, the Trika existed in the valley. See, you, you can see I'm differentiating, distinguishing between Kashmiri Shaivism and Trika for the sake of analysis. Because remember, at this time, in these four generations, um, a, a great deal of commentatorial work on the Shaiva Siddhanta took place. Ramakanta, his son, uh, Sri Kanta, Ra, Sri Kanta, then the Narayana Kanta, then another Ramakanta, they wrote commentaries on the Siddhanta arguments. And all of these were before Abhinav Gupta. Ah. So these people were Kashmiris and they were Siddhantis. So Kashmiri Shaivism was developing in that direction. Right? See, there are two things we need to distinguish. One is what is revealed, Prakya, or Prakasha, if you like, in a different from a different perspective. And the other is the understanding of what is being revealed. Upakya, if you're using the terminology of poetics, or Vimarsha, if you're using the terminology of Pratyabhikya. Okay? So there's a great deal of Prakasha is going on, a tremendous amount of illumination. So what we need now is more Vimarsha. Okay? Not only on what has been said, from the time of Shiva Sutra to Gupta, but also on the immense amount that have been said in the Siddhanta Agabas before him. Okay? So we're up to date. Now, Abhinav Gupta, when we meet Abhinav Gupta the first time, he's wrote a, a very nice, uh, a modest commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. He's a student, he's writing for another student. Okay? Uh, and you can see he's sort of full of life. He's bursting with beans, right? And the next thing he plunges into, uh, he already knows about uh, the Kali Krama. Uh, he refers to the Kali Krama in his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. Um, he is learning from the Bhagavad Gita from the son of a man who came to teach him Krama. Okay? So he's already got a taste of that. Now then what happens is the next thing that he writes is a thing called the Sri Purva Panchika that we have lost. Now, the Sri Purva Panchika uh, is, a, is a commentary of Sri Purva. Sri Purva means the Mali Vijay Uttara. Okay? Now, we lost that. But the next thing that we write is a thing called the Mali Vijay Vartika, which we still do have. And it's a Vartika. A Vartika is a kind of commentary in which uh, things are added that have been said implicitly but not explicitly stated. Ah, it's different from a vritti. A vritti is a very concise explanation. Okay? And that vartika is, is actually on the, the first verse of the Mali Vijay Uttara. And tremendously more because there are some 2,000 very tough verses full of chock-a-block of resonant with very deep, juicy and extensive philosophical and mystical reflections that I won't go into now, but are as mind-blowing in every verse. You know, you, you don't really need to say much about Abhin to just read what he writes. And uh, uh, you got enough to, to talk to people for, for years, which is what I have been doing. Um, okay? Now, next thing that comes along is he writes a commentary on the Paratlin Shikavivarana. Now, we know the order because he, Mali Vijay Vartika, some teaching that's there is mentioned in the Paratrinshika Vivarana. Okay? And we know Paratrinshika Vivarana is beyond the next one, which is his masterpiece, is Tantra Loka. Okay? So here we have a young man, okay, who is writing tremendous stuff and extremely kaula. Okay? Um, looking at the tantras that Abhinav Gupta quotes, we discovered that 11 out of about 120 
to which he refers are Trika Tantras, okay? And of those, they have a range that goes from mildly Kaula, like the Mali Vijayotara, is mildly Kaula. Huh? It doesn't talk to us a lot about animal sacrifice, uh, you know, offering meat and wine, uh, or any of that SCX, Maituna, you know, Adi Yaga, as Abhinav Gupta calls it, which he considers to be the highest puja you can do, that only someone like he could do it. So I suppose he must have done it if he knows that he could do it, okay? <laughs> well, he would. I mean, my goodness, this is a man in his 20s and 30s, you know? And uh, tremendously brilliant, yeah? He, he's talked, uh, he's been learning from gurus all over the valley uh, of, of different kinds, sedantes, non sedantes He says, I even went to Vaishnava as a Buddhist. Uh, out of curiosity, not out of conviction, of course. But the one teacher that is his main, the axis around which everything turns, is Shambhunata. Now, you see, going through Tantra Loka since 1975, huh? how many years is that? Almost 50 years, okay? You notice, if you notice, say, still now, every day I notice something. So imagine how many things one notices in 50 years. Yeah. Now, one of the things that we notice is that, yes, Abhinava Gupta is constantly referring to Shambhunata as his master. He's the only teacher that he refers to as having caused the lotus of his heart to blossom by the rays of his lotus feet. He's the only one. All the others have done all kinds of things for him, but he's the only one from whom he's telling us in this way he uh, was inspired to enlighten. Him and, of course, the goddess. I don't want to go into the history of how Shambhunath and the goddess worked together on Abhinav Gupta. Abhinav Gupta also received Diksha from the goddess directly. All right? That's in the Paratrishika of Ivarana. Okay? Now, the point is this. Imagine now counting texts in the Tantra Loka, how often Abhinav Gupta quotes them. Right? One of the volumes of my 13 volumes of Tantra Loka um, is an extensive, detailed analysis of everything that he quotes, right? And um, a lot of which, some of which I found in manuscript in Nepal and in South India, okay, over the years. Right? Now, there you find that. The, the, the Abhinava Gupta supreme scripture is the Mali Vijayota. And he says there's nothing in the Abhinava, uh, let me tell you this before I go back to come back to Shambhunata. He says there's nothing in the Tantra Loka that is not so explicitly in the Mali Vijayota. He says pretty well at the beginning of this Tantra Loka, right? Now he's not telling us directly, but he is that his Tantra Loka is a commentary on the Malijotra. Remember I told you there were no commentaries on the Tantras? So Amalini, the, the Tantra Loka is a commentary on the Tantras. He also calls it a compendium, a collection of texts taken from the Tantras. Okay? So... Right, and he also calls it the puja padati. We'll go into all that in a moment. Now, Abhinava Gupta meets Shambhunata. Now, Shambhunata, his guru was Sumati, who came from Dakshinapata, which I suppose is Karnataka, the Deccan. Eh? And his guru was a man who was called Bhairavacharya, and Bhairavacharya was an expert in the five currents of scripture and the Pashupati, the Atimarga of the Pashupatas, and of course, Trika Shavas. Right? So Shambhunata comes with this big package into the valley. He comes from Jalandara. Eh? Jalandara, Peter. He comes with this big package of Trika Shavism, means the Tantra, in a way which is completely normal for all other Tantric traditions. You have the Guru, the Guru has the scripture, the Guru transmits. Uh, it gives you initiation, it gives you adhikara to study the scripture and to practice the procedures 
that are taught in it ought to be enlightened directly in a flash because this is Carlism um, by what the scriptures say. Okay? So imagine this, think of this, it's mind blowing. Uh, Abhinav Gupta attributes. He refers to Shabunat in more than 60 places, which is as much as any other tantra except the Mani Vijayotra, as having taught him 60 different things, and some of them very extensive, right? If you count it all together, half of Tantra Loka, Abhinav Gupta tells us that he learned from Shabunat. Okay? Now, we'll go back to that. Now, how did he learn from him? Now, this is very important. We know that Shabu Nata would sit with him and read a tantra. Think how different this is from nowadays what we call Kashmiri Shavis. Okay? I, I, I think how different it is from what we nowadays call Kashmiri Shavis. Kashmiri Shaivism is unique in all tantric schools anywhere, in Tibet, all the way to Japan, the whole of India, because it doesn't have a ritual that is being taught from scripture. I don't know if you noticed that. If you go to South India, they're doing Sri Chakra Puja, or in Banaras or anywhere, and you tell them I'm a tantric, but I don't do puja, they think you're a nutcase or a cheat. And Swamiji did do some puja, but it was, uh, it was not at all central to his practice, okay? This is the only tantric tradition in existence ever in any part of the world, in any India, in the whole of Asia, that's like that, okay? okay. Now, I'm going to have a group to look at this tantra loka. He calls his Tantra Loka Padati. Right? So the first one of the first things that Sanderson asked when he went to meet Swami, he says, You do the puja. And we left Tantra back. No, we don't do the puja. Why should we do the puja? We do meditation. We we do uh, you know, there are all these pujas anavupai, you know. And uh, we do other anavupai, plenty of that, okay? All right? Now, my students, some of them, they're doing puja hours and hours every day. Nine days, you know, Durga puja and 10 hours of puja daily. Shivaratri, 24 hours. Shivaratri, puja, 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 puja. Okay? They know a month to push them back to front. They recite Durga Saptashati, you know, seven times every day on Durga, Durga Navrata. Understand? This is our... This is our Hinduism. From North to South India, they're doing that. Right? And in Tantric traditions, well, you have the Ten Mahavidya, so you do the Puja for Bhaglamukhi, or Dumavati, or Tara, or Sodashi, Dumavati, Bhuvaneshwari, etc. Puja, Puja, Puja. Or you are uh, initiated into Sri Chakra, Puja, Puja, Puja. Right? Now, Mark Dishkovsky is not doing puja five, ten hours a day. He's a cheat. What kind of tantric is this? Huh? George is smiling there. I don't want to tell you what, I, what Swamiji once said to him concerning people who do puja because you get insulted. Huh? My students had a long time. I have students who do a lot of puja, okay? Why were they into puja? And I'm, I'm at a loss because I admire them. My goodness, the energy, you know. I said, I hope that they're not right because otherwise I'm, you know, meditation is, who cares about meditation? You know, I mean, you know, the devata is waiting for all the japas and crows and crows of mantra, okay? Now, this is absent. But you see, paradoxically, I should notice that Abhinav Gupta in his Tantra Loka, he gives an explanation of how puja is effective because everything that is done in all every ritual action, every mantra that you utter is immersed in consciousness. 
Shankaracharya does not believe that puja they understand it will not give you liberation if you read Mandukya Upanishad in the time they're fools I mean even 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 Krishna says you know that the Brahmins are, are, who are there uh, reading Veda and doing all this yagyas I, 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 I like people just standing in tanks of water you know they, they can't swim around they can't move around they just think that they're just doing something but they're not I understand hello <coughs> Nabhinava Gupta is not like that at all we have uh, more equivalence for what puja is, what homa is, what dhyanam is, uh, what mantra is, what tarpana is, etc. Analogies for that within the inner activity of consciousness than any other tradition. Okay? But nowhere, nowhere, nowhere do we say that takes over from doing homa. Except in it seems in the, in the Vijana Bhairava Tantra. But that's very quickly covered over. We don't want you to stop doing Homa. We don't want you to stop doing Puja. But what, what is necessary is if you want to get liberation from that, you have to know the activity of consciousness to which that outer action corresponds. Or have our group that spends its hold of Tatra Loka teaching us that. Okay? This is why the Sri Chakra people, the Sri Vidya people, they studied Kashmiri Shaivism extremely deeply and then applied it to their, yes, commentary. Their commentary on the Nitya Sodashi Karma. Okay? Because you had Prakasha with no Vimarsha. And Abhinav Gupta tells you that Puja, what is Puja? Vimarsha. So if George uh, or Dim Fuji suddenly realizes, oh, you know, I am supreme essence of Marcia, it's called Puja. Because when you realize that, you will be flat on your face in adoration and you will be bathing in Shakti Park. You feel that you're dissolving away into the object of your awareness because you're so much deeply in love with them that the union that takes place transcends far beyond any kind of union that can happen physically. So Vimarsha is Puja. Right? I'm giving you an example. Now Tantra Loka is the most detailed treatise on ritual that we have in India that finds all internal equivalents within consciousness. Because this is the only system in the whole of India that considers consciousness to be active. It's the only one. It's the only one. Everywhere else, consciousness just watches. And even some of them says it's even not got nothing to look at if they're non dual. Right? He's watching what? Nothing, because there is nothing to see. Okay? We're the only people with, who don't do puja and who have an active consciousness. And why? That activity is the puja. Right? Now that activity and knowing that it is the puja, we call bhakti. Bhakti simply isn't a sort of labi dabi, I love my goddess. You know, it's a sort of cuddly, cuddly, little Krishna sort of trip. And uh, we don't mean that by, by bhakti. By bhakti we mean the full intensity of Shakti Pat that brings you, you know, a, a totally devastating vimarsha that, you know, I am all this sarvo, shivo ham uh, sarvo yam mama vibhava. Ah, that's what causes, this will cause the word white, you know. Another one like that now be gone. <laughs> that was only a second. And that happened 50 years back. <laughs> okay, you see what I mean. Now, let's let's get back to the main point, no more. Uh, joking around. Abhinava Gupta, he will never, 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 never say that he has written something from his own mind. Now, I'll give you a very nice example, and that uh, my 
the one of the greatest scholars I admire uh, is uh, Professor Rastogi. I don't know if he's still with us. Uh, he knows all this, so he'd probably be bored to hear all this. So it doesn't matter. Um, uh, but he uh, and another one was um, uh, Gaya Chara, not Gaya Chara, uh, Tripathi. Uh, there is a verse in um, uh, Natya Shastra where Abhinav Gupta says, I can't tell you the original, I'm sorry. Um, he says, after climbing and much labor and having ascended to the top of this mountain, I look around and see to my astonishment that I'm all alone. He's ascended the mountain of hermeneutics. He's ascended the mountain of understanding Shastra. And I look to the left and the right and I discover to my astonishment I'm all alone. And I said, ah, but no, that is not possible. How can one rise to these heights without the stairway, the sopana, the ladder that had been put in place before by the great minds that have preceded me? And I see to the left and the right many cities with bridges and roads and everything has been connected. All this has already been built by the people before me. So Abhinava Gupta will always, 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 always say that whatever I may say which is new, and he said a lot of new things, they are never completely new because they are the culmination of the exegetical tradition of an extremely rich exegetical tradition that is that is blowing up, expanding at a tremendous rate within the domain of Shaivagama, within the domain of the poetics, within the domain of dramaturgy, within these different domains, within the domain of Pratibhigya, and so on, right? So I could stop almost everywhere. I could stop now, really. Um, the point is I want to make is this, that in going through the Tantra Loka, and uh, there are about 7,000 pages out there in small print in Royal Octavo. Um, and I feel that I've hardly scraped the surface. Uh, no doubt other scholars, great scholars like Sanderson, would do a much better job. Um, uh, I, I've certainly, Swamiji has things to say that I couldn't have even begun to think of, uh, and they'll always remain there. Um, uh, um, if that journey has been made in looking for what Abhinav Gupta himself has said. Right? Now, if I'm allowed the last few minutes towards the end of this lecture, uh, uh, and I haven't been too controversial and upsetting to anybody, uh, I'd like to tackle one or two things, the new things that Abhinav Gupta has said that are never entirely new, but uh, are so brilliant that practically what was said before uh, pales into darkness, right? Now, one of the many things I think that we should mention right at the beginning is the concept of speech. Paravaj, supreme speech. Bharti Hari had developed three levels of speech. Ah, Vaikhari, Madhyama, and Pashyanti. I'm sure all of you people here are very well acquainted with these three levels. Ah. Then Utpaladeva, in a couple of verses, and they're just two, uh, he tells us that there is there is another level of speech, who, which is Pratyava Bhashini, that reflects back on its own nature. Eh? And that that level of speech is um, supreme, and that that level of speech is pure eye consciousness. Right? There is all that Abhida, that uh, Bharti uh, Utpaladeva has to say about Paravaj. Okay. Now, of course, all you people who are uh, so learned here, much more than me, uh, will have read the Paratrinshika Vivarana and noticed that right at the beginning uh, of his exposition, Abhinava Gupta comments on the words the goddess said, Dave Yuvacha. Torella has written a nice article about that. And in the course of saying, well, if the goddess spoke in the past, then how do we know what she's saying in the present? Eh? 
I mean, is there time uh, that she, in the past and the future, for for consciousness, which is the deity's nature, and all of this? So then he says, when she spoke, what she means is that she spoke at a higher level of speech, and this higher level of speech came down to the corporeal level and is embodied in the words of the Paratrishika. In this way, he says, spoke in the sense of the first level, highest level, para. Okay? And he gives an exposition of the four levels of speech, beginning with para, right the way down to Vekari, which has been the standard, the gold mark, benchmark for the whole of the Indian tradition. Um, even, even that part of the Indian tradition that for centuries had totally forgotten about it, right? Now, in that exposition, what is essential, that is his own, almost his own, is, of course, the understanding of para as a hum, and as mantra vidya, the vitality of mantra. Now, he talks about this right at the beginning of the Paratrishika Vivarana, the commentary of the Paratrishika Vivarana. Why? Well, it's not just that he's a thorough commentator and he wants to uh, comment on Devi Vacha right at the beginning. It's because central to the teaching of the Paratrishika Vivarana, as I suppose all of you know, is that if you're ready, and Master is ready, or Goddess is prepared to do it, you achieve enlightenment by just uttering Parabija Sao. Just once. Okay? You get Diksha, and that Diksha is liberating. This is central to the Paratrishika, Paratrishika teachings. So if that's central, then right at the beginning, <coughs> Abhinava Gupta has to explain how it is that the mantra has that balance of power. That I just say Sao Bija once, and I'm enlightened. I'm freed of the bondage that has been uh, tormenting me for thousands of lifetimes. How, how can that mantra be so powerful? And, and the reason for that is, is because it is saturated with mantra virya. And what is that mantra virya? I am. I am. Aham. It's full of supreme subjectivity of Lord Shiva, and that subjectivity is the goddess. Okay, so there you see we have how Abhinav Gupta has built up on a teaching of his grand teacher, the Utpala Deva, huh? and from a hint, he's developed it into a, a, a massive exegesis of what mantra is. I won't go into it now, but uh, in the 80s, it was very popular amongst foreign scholars to talk about mantra as language. And what do we mean? What kind of language is mantra? But nobody really noticed that Abhinav Gupta had gone into that a thousand years ago. Um, right? So, Tripratyamidam Gyanam Guruta. Guru here is the Trika Guru Shambhunata and other teachers, Bhuti Raja. Uh, he's the other Shambhunatha taught in Krama system. Uh, Shastrata. Shastra, of course, is all of the Shaivagava. Because according to a teaching given to him by Shambhunatha, scripture is prasiddhi. What we commonly know to be true. And all of the, the highest embodiment of what we most instinctively and profoundly know is true is Trika, Shastra. And that same prasiddhi permeates all scripture. It's what makes scripture, scripture. So that has allowed him to say that Trika extends, is, is the whole of the Shaivam. But just like consciousness is active, there are also many layers and levels. So within this unity, there is a hierarchy. Uh, in many ways, ontological and epistemological and so many, and in this particular case of revelation. 
and that hierarchy is contained in the single whole, which we call trika. And Abhinav Gupta, just to put his chap huh, on uh, his own understanding, come through his teacher scripture called that trika, Anuttara trika. Huh. So this Anuttara trika, okay? So there you are. This allowed Abhinav Gupta to make use of all the Shaivagava in the construction or the presentation of what he called Anuttara Trika. Santi padatyaha, bahua padatyaha, anya srotreshu, santi bahua padatyaha, kintu Anuttara Trika kula krame ekam apinavidyate, ekopinavidyate. There are many padatis in the many schools, the shrotas of uh, the Agamas, it says that there is not a single one that we find for Anuttara Trika. And this is why he's writing Tantra Loka. So here, to go full circle for where I began, is a tradition, the only tantric tradition in the world, huh? without ritual, or primarily without ritual. Huh? And yet, the propagator of this system, if you call it Trika, to make it Tantra, you see, if you just had Pratyabhigya, if you just had Shiva Sutra, maybe if you just had Krama system, then you would call this, you wouldn't call it Trika Shaivism, you'd call it Krama system. Because it's the only one that is actually scriptural. Do you understand? It's the only one that's scriptural. Whereas we call the whole of the tradition now by extension, the whole of the exegesis, Pratyabhigya is Vimarsha, Shiva Drishti is Vimarsha, Spanda Karika is Vimarsha, okay? And the teachings that Shivananda brought is a higher level of Vimarsha, of Krama teachings from what were well before. And the Shiva Sutra, I would say, and this is what, I, what Shema Raja tells us, is Sarva, 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 Shaiva Upanishad, Sarva Shaiva Rahasya Upanishad. Huh? So in that way, even Shiva Sutra is a Vimarsha. Okay? So in this whole huge exegesis, profound exegesis that happened three, four generations with Gupta, he ties it all up and puts it all into Trika. So that he reconnects this exegesis to the tradition, to the Shaiva Agama. You understand? And not only does he do that, but he gives you a commentary on the highest part of the Shaiva Agama, which is Trika, which can trickle all the way down, right back to the very beginnings and the, 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 the lowest levels, if you like to think of it that way, of the Siddhanta. Right? And I conclude here, having done that, he gave a model for ritual and its interpretation that was taken over by, for example, Sri Vidya. This is the only tradition in the whole of India, okay? And by extension, the whole of Asia, for God's sake, where Trika, where ritual is explained. You understand? Otherwise, if you're doing Bhagla Mukhi, eh, any of the Dasha Mahavidyas, you're doing Sri Chakra Puja and so on, you just got thousands of mantras to repeat, to repeat, to repeat, and do this and do that and sprinkle around and ring bells and offer incense, you know, and throw flowers and mantra and mantra and mantra with no explanation. So this tradition, paradoxically, where there's no puja, there's the explanation of puja. Okay? And this has been done by Abhinav. And one last thing, when you read it, you take Bali Vijayottara and you read it together with Tantra Loka. Okay? You see that he quotes it literally more than half of it. He refers to all the rest of it in a very, 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 very clever way. He doesn't just say, well, look, you know, 
um, I don't know, uh, sansaram kurakaranam, and then he gives you a nice explanation underneath. No, he weaves in the reference together with one or two words he puts in here and there, and in his own way. So the what you get is you get prakasha and vimarsha together. You see what I mean? So he's not only teaching. Uh, so this is the way. And because this has been done in this way, and this is the last thing I have to say, because he did this so brilliantly, we have the whole of the scholarly tradition, the modern scholarly tradition, has completely forgotten the difference between prakya and upakya, between vimarsha, between prakasha and vimarsha, between revelation and exegesis. So the what we got is we got a salad that we call Kashmiri Shavas. But this was not like this for any of those masters. And this is a true tantric system. Okay? So I'm sorry if I've taken too much of your time. Thank you for your patience. Um, I don't want to. Huh? Thank you very kind of you. Thank you so very much, Magji. We are grateful that you took out time despite not being very well. Sundarji, do you have a question or a comment? Oh, hello, Sundarji. Hello, Sundarji. Hello, Magji. Thank you so much. Can I speak? Of Absolutely. Course. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this very comprehensive uh, presentation where historical depth has been combined with uh, uh, strict uh, following, strictly following the text. Um, I mean, it raises many questions, but then, um, you know, I only wanted to raise one from, because that was the only point you made from the aesthetic side. And I thought, uh, and I think you had forgotten the source the exact place. So I just wanted to comment on that because those verses uh, where um, he presents his own synthesis of rasa theory. In, so that uh, long invocate, actually it's an invocatory verse, and it comes in the sixth chapter of the Natya Shastra, commentary in the sixth chapter. Well, which, which, uh, sorry, what are we talking about? We are talking about this Amnaya Siddhe Kim you know, this one, about tradition and his self effacing before tradition. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes, okay. The, yeah. One which you, the one which you paraphrased. Yes, right, yes. 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 Yes, uh, you actually. Uh, yes, the, well, I just wanted to add a small nuance to that because yes, uh, of course. You put it to, yes, if you allow me, yeah, basically yes. you spoke about his self-effacement that he yes. hardly attributes anything to himself. He attributes everything to scripture, and this particular passage, uh, in the that. Shloka, pardon? Yeah, I didn't quite say that. I said that yeah, he could have said what he did. If if had if he didn't have people before him, exactly that's what he says. But a number of times you uh, basically said that we have to deduce uh, what he contributed originally by subtracting scripture and guru from the sum. So no, I just wanted to introduce. Uh, if I can, you know, just finish the point. I'd like to. Yes, yes, uh, yes. yes, please. So actually, what he is doing in this uh, stanza in the commentary on Natya Shastra is that it's important the exact place where it appears. What has yeah. happened, what has happened, what has happened to that stanza is that he has been demolishing all those who came before him, Bhattanayaka, Shri Shankuka. So he's been demolishing all of them. So right. now he's going to present his own thesis. Okay. See? And he doesn't want people to think that he's boasting or right. saying that I'm the I'm all being original, you know, uh, I'm criticizing all these people who came before me. Neither yes. does he want people to think yes. that he is completely neglecting the tradition, that right. he is doing this by himself without the tradition. Absolutely. And in fact, I, actually, the main point he's trying to make, and I think it's important to go through it, is that he is abolishing the distinction between originality, individual originality, his originality, his genius, and tradition. Yes. For him, the two are the same. And oh, if you see, because he says, you see, Amnaya Siddhe Kimapurvam Etat, Samvid Vikase 
So what he is saying is people have these two things, two contradictory things which they resort to, yes. uh, which is that they say, see, first they say, when it has been already established by tradition, why these pretentious claims to originality? So this is yes. one argument which is used. Okay. Then the opposite argument is also used. When yes. self-conscious thought blossoms so freely on its own, why bother to cram down these stifling cannons? So this is how <laughs> the world destroys both originality and tradition. So yes. he's, he's, he's responding Absolutely. by saying, my originality is tradition, you know. Oh, it's okay. opposed to tradition. Uh -huh. So he says, with these two objections, ever so precious and within easy reach, What's then left that this world has not turned to derision? Then he says, climbing ever higher and higher, you know, the, the okay. mountain you said, going to the right. peak. Uh, he says, once the right path has been found and cleared, building bridges and founding entire cities, such yes. architectural feats are no cause for wonder. And he says the most important part. Therefore, right. far from, she has just demolished everybody. And now he's right. saying the opposite. Therefore, right. far from having overturned and demolished here the views yes. of fellow truth seekers, right. the, fact, the views of fellow truth seekers have been merely refined. Right. In the blueprints bequeathed by our predecessors, we yes. recognize the foundations of yes. this crowning achievement of our own labors. Wonderful. So he knows that he's a genius, yes. but he Thank realizes you. at the same time that this genius is coming from the tradition, you know, he's being, he's adding to yes, it, yes, but he would yes, be nowhere yes. without it. Thank so you actually, so it's much. nuance, it's you, nuance. You, you said it a million times better than I could. <laughs> no, I actually translated it in that paper, which I referred to in my, in my own talk. See, actually. <laughs> thank you very much, Mark, for your contribution. Thank you very thank much, Sundarji. Thank you, Sundarji, and thank you, Mark Ji.